Hey everybody, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that the first book from Faith Matters Publishing is now available. It's called All Things New and was written by Fiona and Terrell Givens. When I finished the book, I just thought this has so much potential to actually change lives. They go through and trace the roots of our religious vocabulary and show how so many of these words have become totally unmoored from their original foundation and how a lot of those traditions have been carried forward for hundreds and even thousands of years and are in a lot of ways still damaging us today. And then they dive into how we can reformulate our language in healthy and inspiring ways. This book is so healing. It's hopeful. It's a totally paradigm shifting book that you will not be able to put down. You can pick up a copy for yourself or for friends and family. It's available at Desert Book on Amazon, Audible, and Apple Books. We're so grateful for Terrell and Fiona and all of the amazing work that they've done here. All right, that's all for the book for now, but we have a lot more to come. Thanks as always, and here's the episode. Ben McAdams has had an unusual life in public service. Running as a moderate Democrat in a very conservative Republican state, he managed to be elected as a state senator, then as Salt Lake County mayor, and then as a Utah congressman. Concern for the disadvantaged has always been a driving force in his public life. When McAdams was tasked as mayor with helping to solve the problems of Salt Lake City's homeless population, he felt he needed to understand the issues firsthand, so he spent several days and nights living incognito with the homeless on the streets of the city. In 2020, McAdams was narrowly defeated in his congressional re-election bid. In this conversation with Terrell Givens, he reflects on the disturbing power of tribal political loyalties and asks if political identity now holds greater sway in our lives than our identity as disciples of Christ. They also touch on McAdams' personal and public lives and what will be next for this unique public figure. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoy this conversation. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Conversations with Terrell Givens, sponsored by Faith Matters. I'm your host, Terrell Givens. And I have as my guest with us today, Ben McAdams. And we've known each other a few years. Two years, we, yeah. We met through a mutual friend, Tom Christofferson. And at that time, you were, I believe, a mayor of that's Salt right. Lake County. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you've uh, served in a few additional capacities since that time, most yeah. recently as congressman. Um, until the most recent election, where you were unsuccessful, um, down but not out completely, we hope. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about your experience in uh, Congress, representing what district? Uh, uh, Utah's 4th Congressional District. 4th Congressional yeah. District. So you were there for two years. And uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like, what were your surprises, and what were your disappointments? Well, I say it's the worst job I ever fought to hold on to. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, 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 our country is, of course, very divided. And, uh, and that goes to the top for both the causes and, the, and the, you're feeling it at the top. But, you know, I think surprises were how dysfunctional Congress really is. This is the, it lives up to its reputation. It does live up to its reputation. This is the seat of, of democracy, the, you know, the standard bearer of... of uh, freedom around the world and yet to see the seat of this the united states congress is dysfunctional and not just congress but washington in general is just completely dysfunctional i think was was um disillusioning but i want to say let me you also asked uh surprises too so one surprise is how dysfunctional it is i want to say the other side it also you see good people yeah. who um i think what we have to fix was broken about washington and to fix it we got some people there who are willing to do that. The, there is work that happens across the aisle. People who are willing to to see the best in each other and to try to heal what's broken in this country. And um, so I, I, I was surprised to be inspired, both in, confirmed in my disillusionment, but also inspired at the good that still happens in spite of that, the good people who are there uh, working you know, behind the scenes to try and fix it. Right. Now you're a Democrat. Yeah. Uh, one of few, or were you the only Democrat from Utah's congressional delegation? I am. I was the only Democrat from Utah's congressional delegation, and the only practicing member of the church and a Democrat in in Congress. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. I uh, feel a little lonely at times. It did, did feel it? a little lonely at times. <laughs> well, I'd say it, de- it did feel lonely, but you know, uh, I worked well with other members of the Utah delegation. Consider them. Uh, you know, we we're all Americans before we were Republican and Democrat and had a good working relationship with, with many in the Utah delegation. And then, you know, as a, as a person of faith, I was uh, pleasantly, it was, it was ha- I was happy to see that on both sides of the aisle, there are people of deep faith and deep con- conviction. You know, right. many of my Democratic colleagues are, 
are uh, people of faith and conviction who, like me, are are serving to, you know, to do good and to give back to a country that we love. Right. Now, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints trended Democrat in the old days, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the great shift occurred, I believe, 60s and 70s with the Cultural yeah. Revolution, the Sexual Revolution. Uh, more and more, many of the burning issues in the public sphere uh, seemed to draw Latter-day Saints toward the Republican Party because of their stand on what were called right, traditional family values. Uh, do you see any indications, do you sense any indications that uh, as a consequence of the Trump years, that there may be a shift in those alignments? I think you're seeing not only a shift in the alignment, you know, among members of the church, but uh, and in Utah a little bit. Now, uh, you're speaking to somebody who just lost an election, right? But uh, I do think you look at uh, the number of crossover votes of registered Republicans who voted for me. You saw uh, uh, Joe Biden, his, he, he got 37% of the vote in Utah, which is far from winning right. Utah's electoral votes, but it's a, a market increase from what you've seen in the past. And then you look at what happened in places like Arizona and Nevada, where uh, members of the church, uh, I think largely because of uh, President Trump's moral failings and, and divisive, divisiveness and, and some of his character, major character flaws, you saw them uh, not willing to vote for him. Now, whether that's uh, a, a revisiting of their support for the Republican Party, or if it's just President Trump, I think we'll have to see. I, I have to say, I think you know my political values come. I was raised by a single mother who was a school teacher, and uh, and you know I think there's good in both parties, there's bad in both parties, but you know my mother taught me that you know, um, the value of learning and education and supporting the doors that education can open. And, and I personally benefited from, from many of those things that were available thanks to things like Pell Grants and, and subsidized student loans. Were it not for those things, I wouldn't have gone to college. And so I think that, you know, I felt like um, we're much as given, much as expected. And as a, as a member of Congress and in my, through my public service more broadly, wanted to be part of, of creating opportunities, opening doors for people like like happened for me. And I right. felt that I could do that through the Democratic Party. And like I said, I, there are good ideas and good people in yeah. both parties. But Well, well talk yeah. just a little bit about what other personal values you have that you found aligned more closely with the Democratic Party and drew you there. Yeah, well, you know, I would, I would first say that I don't think any elected official should should hand over their point of view or opinion to a political party or a party platform. I've been criticized. I, people ask me, you know, uh, what I think about the Democratic Party platform. And my answer is, I've never read it, and maybe I should have. But uh, I also maybe take a, a point of pride in not having read it, because that is not a, a guidebook. That is not a book of scripture, whether it's the Republican Party or the Democratic Party platform. That's the opinion of people who wrote the platform. But for me as an elected official, my job is to represent my constituents and to uh, reflect my conscience and do what I believe is best for our country and for our state. And at times that puts me aligned with the Democratic Party. At times it puts me aligned with the Republican Party and sometimes it puts me at odds with both. Uh, I think that for me, I believe that governments are instituted of God for the benefit of man, that um, government can do good, but government's role should be limited and refined. The government, uh, there are things that government can do well and things that government does very poorly. So I believe in, believe in the role of government. I also believe that that role should be limited. I believe in free markets and capitalism, but I think government's role is to place guardrails on that system so that it achieves public good and maximizes opportunities for people who would not otherwise not have them. Well, it seems that we're at a moment in our political history where party alignments are more uncompromising, um, more tenaciously held than before. Um, talk to me a little bit about, about why you think that's the case and because you've just described a kind of relationship to the political party that sounds very healthy um, but how typical do you think you are based on your interactions the kinds of people that you got to know as a serving congressman um, uh, is the public perception correct that party loyalty now seems to displace just about any degree of conscience in american political life so I was the, my voting record, I was the number two most independent member of Congress, most likely to vote against my own party and, and to chart my own course. I think one of the things that's disappointing to me is the degree within elected office 
if you see loyalty to a party. And you see this on both sides of the aisle of Republicans unwilling to go against President Trump, even in the face of some pretty glaring violations of the Constitution, and Democrats unwilling to go against their own party, um, you know, also in, in, I think, in the face of, of policies that may be even bad for the country. Uh, so I think disappointing to me at the elected level, those people who are put loyalty to party above all else. That was certainly not my attitude and, and my record does not reflect that. I was very independent. But I think the interesting thing is, is when you translate that to the American public, you see party affiliation lower than it's ever been. Um, and that coincides, I think, with the distrust and disassociation with institutions generally, and political parties are some of those institutions that people, millennials and others, are pulling back from. But, you know, when, when forced to take the proposition that you need to accept this package of policies part and parcel in order to be a true Democrat or to be a true Republican, uh, people are saying, well, then I'm not a true Democrat. I'm not a true Republican. I'm going to be an independent. I'm going to chart my own course. And so I think you've got this reconciliation that needs to happen of probably within elected office, a greater degree of loyalty to your respective party and the public wanting independence and people who are um, willing to, to chart their own course and form their own opinion. And um, there's, a, there's a disconnect there that needs to be reconciled. So you, are you optimistic or pessimistic looking ahead? We've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. Um, our, our challenge, we've never been more divided since the Civil War. Um, I think it, I expect it to get worse before it gets better. Um, I'm a believer in America and American democracy. And I think ultimately we've overcome some really tough things as a country. I think we'll get through this moment. But at this point, I don't know how or when. So. Are you, are you disappointed that Latter-day Saints seem to show, by and large, the same kind of tenacious party loyalty and polarization as the American public in general? I think that is disappointing. And I think, um, you know, I think some of that, when I think about why or where that comes from, we are taught from our very earliest ages to, to follow the prophet, to, to follow our, our, our church leaders, to su support and sustain our bishop. Uh, even if you disagree with a decision the bishop makes, we support and sustain. So you think that carries over? I think that carries over. I think that is a noble value in, in the church context, a value that I support. But I think that sometimes carries over to the political context where we are going to support our political leaders no matter what. And that is exactly what the con it's the opposite of what the Constitution intended. Well, that's interesting because I've written before on the, on the subject of the paradoxes of American culture, uh, of, of Latter-day Saint culture. And one of the principal paradoxes is this tension that exists in our theology and in our tradition between authoritarianism on the one hand and this kind of radical, right, individualism, this emphasis on agency, right? The first hymn published in Emma Smith's hymn book was Know This, That Every Soul Is Free. Um, it sounds to me like you think we're getting to a point where uh, authority is winning the battle over individual conscience. I think that's right. And I think, um, you know, I think that we should always... The Constitution expects us to always question our elected officials. That's what an election's about. And, uh, and I think we should, you know, Joseph Smith taught about the, the values of it, look for the character of an individual first and the, the qualifications that, that make somebody a noble public servant. And um, I think we should hold ourselves to that, to always question our elected officials, always be willing to vote against someone regardless of party, and to look for, for character and values first. Yeah. Well, what was it that first drew you into politics? T tell us a little bit about the, the beginnings of your political career. Yeah, I, I don't know that I ever expected to run for, well, I think the first... Student body president. Well, even before that, I would say. <laughs> so as a, as a missionary in Brazil. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm. You know, I guess you could say Fiz me São Brasil. Fiz me São São Paulo Leste. Me São São Paulo Leste. São Paulo Sul. Okay. Uh, that was probably São Paulo Sul was probably my mission at the time. When right. We were would there. have been there only four. Probably carved out yeah. of that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, I I saw in Brazil incredible wealth like I had never seen in Utah, and incredible poverty. Like this would have been in the eighties, nineties, 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 ninety three, ninety ninety four to ninety six. That was in Brazil. So. Um, you know, I, and so, and my personal experience, so, um, raised by a single mother, she was on a school teacher salary. We had six kids. We were not a wealthy family. I remember times where our power was shut off where our home was in foreclosure, where, you know, the end of the month, we always had rice and butter was the meal, you know, for, for the last week of the month. And 
Um, things were really tight as a family. I get in Brazil, and first of all, I think as a missionary, what a what an incredible experience to be stripped of everything, every identifying characteristic. I was not this low income kid um, of a single home. I was wearing a white shirt and a name tag like everybody else. And what mattered was how hard I was willing to work, how fervently I was willing to pray. That's all that mattered. And so I felt that was a great opportunity to to rise above maybe my expectations or my opportunities. But I also saw in Brazil where some little things really made a difference for people. Access to a, a good education. If they could learn, if they could get a good uh, schooling, and, that, and not everybody was guaranteed a good education, but access to schooling, um, access to learning English was major, and having a telephone. Most people didn't have a telephone in the day, and if you had a telephone, the world of economic opportunities that were open to you and connections to society were so major. Nobody had telephones because you had to pay up front for the line. It was like $10,000 for a line, and nobody could afford that. Um, and I, I came away, I think, believing that you know hard work matters, that what I did mattered, but knowing that I came back from my mission and but wanted, it's not an even playing field. Not is even, that what it's you not learned? Not even playing field. Yeah. For the first time. Now, and and that's maybe what makes me a moderate is I believe that government can't do everything for us. Um, it it does matter. We need people to people are responsible for their own actions and people are responsible for lifting themselves up. But doors have to be opened. And if if doors weren't open for me or doors weren't open for people I saw in Brazil, they could never lift themselves up. And I came back from my mission and and went to college. But I know that. Uh, you know, I was living at home, commuting and paying for a car and tuition and that and working two and sometimes three jobs at the same time to do that. But even in spite of all of my hard work, if I hadn't received a Pell Grant, I would have had to drop out of college. So I think that kind of formed my political philosophy of individualism and hard work matter. But there's a role for government to open doors so that people can lift themselves up. And um, it was when I was in college that I was studying to be an electrical engineer. I loved math and I loved science, but I didn't, it wasn't, wasn't exciting me like I thought it would. And I um, enrolled in Dan Jones, Political Science 101, and uh, fell in love. Loved this was at? The University of Utah. Mm -hmm. So l fell in love with that, um, started, still continued my electrical engineering studies, which I ultimately abandoned about four years into the degree but um, loved taking one or two political science courses every semester. I got involved on a campaign, volunteered for a campaign, and um, just, just saw the opportunity to give back through public service that I felt like I could, I had been, was lucky, felt lucky to be where I was as a college student, then went on to law school, um, but felt a responsibility to maybe give back and that this was an area where I could give back and to give service to my, a community that I love that I had benefited so greatly from. So the first public office that you held? Well, as you said, I, I ran for student body president at the University of Utah. Um, and, uh, you got a taste of power. <laughs> got a taste of, uh, I guess, got a taste of the hard work and the, the thankless job. But, you know, what? so the thing that I ran for, so usually student body president at the university is uh, goes through the fraternity system. And I, I wasn't involved with the fraternity. I was too busy working and I, I wasn't living on campus and I didn't have a lot of free time for social activities So because I was working hours every week to pay tuition. But I decided to run and I felt that there was a path to winning outside of the fraternity system. So my pitch was we had a lot of Seeing uh, a lot of parents with kids at the university, and I saw a lot of women who were actually having to drop out of school because they didn't have access to childcare. So I campaigned on starting a childcare center at the University of Utah for families who needed access to childcare, and that was my platform, and we won. Uh, reaching out to non traditional students who normally wouldn't vote in a student body election because they didn't care, it didn't affect them. Right. We, we yes, made an argument that, that there was something that their student government could give to them, and, um, and we won, and we started a child care center at the University of Utah. That's still going today. Still going today. In fact, uh, my wife works for the University of Utah, and uh, our youngest. Uh, was it, it, what's, what slots student don't, students don't take, employees can, can use them. So my youngest was enrolled in that child care program. Mm -hmm. And then following graduation, then you went to Columbia Law School. Yeah, went to Columbia Law and uh, I got married. My wife, um, my wife um, we went to high school together and then uh, she went to Utah State and graduated. And I got back from my mission and decided I wanted to date her. 
and she wanted to go on a mission and wasn't interested. So she left, she went to Vienna, Austria on a mission. I, I was at the University of Utah. She came back and we started dating for a couple of years. And then um, we got married and then moved to New York together to go to law, law school. She was actually doing law school at BYU. And, um, and then she transferred and she did her second and third year of law school with me at Columbia. And then you served in state government before you ran for mayor, is that right? So yeah, so we, we moved back. Our twins were born in New York and we moved back. We wanted to raise them in Utah, close to family. So we moved back to Utah. And uh, I was working for a law firm in Utah when um, Ralph Becker was elected mayor of Salt Lake City in 2007. And he asked me, I had known him, uh, there are only like five Democrats in Utah, so we all know each other. <laughs> and uh, he asked me to come work for him. And he said, typically there's a pretty divisive relationship between Salt Lake City and our state legislature. And he said he wanted to end the divisiveness. He wanted, we're the capital city of the state. We need to work together with our state legislature. There are going to be differences from time to time, but we need to work with them. He wants to build a relationship. And he said he needs, um, he wanted somebody who was a Democrat and a practicing member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who could work to bridge that divide. I think that narrowed the applicant pool down to me. <laughs> so, and my wife says, I've never been offered a pay cut I didn't take. So uh, with, with the offer of a lower salary and an intriguing prospect, I think to give back to a community that I love and wanted to see that healing take place as well, I took that job in Salt Lake City as uh, Director of Government Affairs uh, out of the mayor's office. And I did that. Um, I did that, and that led me to then running for the state senate. And I ran and was elected to the state senate and served a term in the state legislature, and then went on to uh, run for mayor of Salt Lake County. And I did that for almost two terms, and then Congress. Now, was it while you were mayor that you engaged in a rather unusual experiment to, uh, to see how the other half lives? Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? What was your yeah. motivation, and what were your discoveries? Well, so I, I'm mayor, and I, I say there are the issues that you choose to engage on, and there are the issues that choose you. And uh, well, so homelessness was an issue that wasn't anything I really had a lot of background on. Certainly, I think we all care about the plight of, of the disadvantaged and the homeless, but we had some challenges downtown in, with crime and drug dealing and drug use and um, businesses that were going out of business because customers wouldn't come to the downtown in the vicinity of the homeless shelter. And so there was a clamor to do something about it. What are we going to do to, to make the situation safe? In fact, there were uh, calls to move the homeless shelter outside of the downtown. So I'm the mayor of Salt Lake County. Uh, city government usually will handle police, law enforcement, some of this like brick and mortar stuff. County government is social services. So we were the, uh, I was the largest um, government, I was responsible for the largest government uh, with uh, social services dealing with this situation. And so when I heard about the calls to move the shelter, I felt that that was the wrong question, that we could move the shelter out of sight, out of mind, the situation would still be broken and not working. And I'd be responsible for a broken system that just got moved. We spent million, we'd spend millions of dollars to move it to a new location. So I engaged to say, there's gotta be a better way. We wanna understand how the system works and what we can do better. Um, you know, this is, I, I could speak for hours about some of the work we did, but at the heart of it, I would say we wanted to create a system that did more than just help somebody survive from one day to the next. Our system was very good at giving somebody a meal and a bed, and that's important. But if we wanted to get at the root causes, what's underlying a person's crisis that leaves them in homelessness, oftentimes there's it's more than just lack of a job or lack of a meal. It's domestic violence. It's uh, kids who have aged out of the foster care system. It's mental health and addiction. Um, and there are plurality of reasons that leave somebody homeless. And if all we do is treat them one size fits all and um, give them a meal and a bed, you're never gonna get to that underlying cost. So I brought forward some recommendations to fix that. And we asked the state legislature for $30 million to, to realign our homeless services system. And uh, as part of that request, the legislature then, after um, successful lobbying effort over a couple of months, they came forward and said, we're going to give you $30 million with the expectation that you will be personally responsible for finding the location of the last homeless shelter that, uh, facility that we're looking for. Um, so I, I took that charge. I think that was probably intended to end my 
poli political career. <laughs> it's not an easy task for an elected official to, to deal in, but I, I accepted that charge. Kind of like trying to find a county to situate a nuclear waste dump. Right, on. yeah. <laughs> just about as desirable. Just, just about as desirable. But I felt like, um, you know, I didn't, put for me, public service isn't a job. It's an opportunity to serve. And if this is what the circumstances, this is this, if this is the responsibility that the circumstances have given me, then I would take it and, and honorably discharge my duty. And so we did, and um, I held a series of town hall meetings, about 10 town hall meetings over the course of about a month, where thousands of people showed up to protest and object to anything relating to a, a new homeless shelter. And I under, certainly understand the concerns. That is, um, there were a lot of fear and, and what this might look like and what it could do to a neighborhood. And so I was empathetic to those who were uh, concerned about it. And at the end of the day, I, the legislature had given me a deadline of March 30th. And, uh, found myself a, a few days before that with really no good option, no perfect option, some, some options that could work. But I felt like there was a, a part of it, we had heard from the public, we had done everything we could to make the best decision, but one piece was missing was firsthand perspective. So it was a Friday afternoon that I left my office, I changed out of my suit and put on um, old clothes, took a backpack and uh, I went downtown and spent uh, three days and two nights living on the streets of Salt Lake City. Uh, I slept the first night I slept on the street and talked to many of the people who were homeless and sleeping on the street, wanted to know why, where there was space in a, a homeless shelter, why they chose to sleep on the street. How did you present yourselves to them? Did they know that you were? They didn't know who I was. So they took you as another homeless person? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. um, clearly I was new, so they were giving me the inside scoop on where you could go to how to how to get in line at the soup kitchen, what to do. I'd ask them, you know, I'm hungry, where do I go? And, um, the second night I slept in the shelter and um, it was eye opening. And, um, you know, so, and, and just was able to see most of the homeless services that we deliver and go through the intake process for them and, and experiencing them firsthand and came away with, first of all, a conviction that I needed to do something. Some of my staff were encouraging me to just hand it back to the legislature and say we were unsuccessful. I, I came away knowing that. I had to do something, but I couldn't. I couldn't turn away from this responsibility that people were relying on me to make a decision, and um, you know, and really uh, some insights as to what needed to happen. Uh, seeing firsthand some of the crime and violence and availability of of drugs in the homeless system and how to address that, and a conviction that we needed to open up new doors for people. Uh, so we came away. We I made a decision on siting a shelter. That facility is now open and operating. And uh, we went ahead and we doubled the size of our drug treatment programs to get people uh, in who are suffering from mental health, mental uh, illness and addiction to get them help to turn their lives around. And you know, I, I'm proud today to say that um, thousands of people have been able to take advantage of who were caught in this eddy this, um, of, of addiction and cycling through the criminal justice system who were able to get help, to get back on their feet, to get a job, and, um, and, and are now contributing members of society. And if you might indulge me, just one, one quick story with that. Sure. So I want to tell you about a woman I met in this process. Part of this was also, we said that we were not going to tolerate just crime, rampant crime, and turn a blind eye to crime on the streets of our downtown. That we are going to hold people accountable who break the law but if they want to turn their life around, we were going to offer them treatment instead of jail. And um, we launched an operation in 2017 to do that. And um, one of the people that was arrested, she was arrested on August 21st, 2017, a woman by the name of Destiny Garcia. She was a heroin addict, um, homeless. She had numerous convictions, mostly related to shoplifting, things related to her addiction to get money to buy, buy drugs. Um, she was arrested and she was taken to Salt Lake County Jail and told that that it was different this time, that there was a treatment bed available to her to her if she wanted it. And she took that treatment option, like hundreds of other people that same week that were arrested. Um, I met her when she was coming out of intensive inpatient treatment. It would, would have been January of 2018. Um, she um, was graduating and looking for a job. And I so I, I met her. And followed her followed her story over the next few weeks that she was um, trying to get a job, but people would look at, employers would look at her criminal background and they'd fire her or uh, various reasons she couldn't get a job. And so I um, 
interviewed her and hired her to be the receptionist in the Salt Lake County Mayor's office. Um, and I think not only the opening the door of her treatment, but then a, a job and to be accepted into a community, she has thrived. And uh, she remains a close personal friend of mine today. I had her uh, to testify to Congress when I was there about addiction. Her son, who she missed most of his teenage years, but has reunited with him. He just returned from a mission. I had the um, honor of, of performing. He was married in the temple, um, but they had a civil ceremony for uh, family members who couldn't attend the simple temple ceremony. I had the honor of pre uh, presiding at his wedding. Um, and it just, for me, highlights the, the worth of a soul, yeah. that um, people in the most desperate of circumstances, with the right op if the right door is open, and certainly there was a lot of responsibility on her to do her part, but she lifted herself up and she's turned her life around and she's um, paying taxes and not receiving government aid and, and uh, is really is giving back to society and inspiring others to do the same. Well, let me segue from that story to a, a broader question. Uh, you mentioned the fact that there are many good men and women from a variety of faith traditions and cultures serving in Congress. Um, as Latter-day Saints, or speaking to you as a Latter-day Saint in particular, what is there about our theology, our, our doctrine, or our history that you think should give us a particularly strong perspective from which to make unique contributions to the world of politics? I think our faith tradition says that we are not passive recipients of life circumstances, that we, you know, we, we from our earliest days, reject, reject the notion of uh, predestination. Um, and we believe that, you know, faith without works is dead, that, um, that by engaging in our own salvation and the salvation of others, that that matters, right? And so I think that's a faith tradition that is a little bit unique, that we aren't just we aren't passive recipients of our salvation. We are active participants. And that salvation isn't just something that is um, measured on a scale at the end of the day, but it's where much is expected, much is required. We are judged and subjectively due to what we've received and and what we did with what we received so that I think that's a perspective that says we, sh we can and should be actively engaged in creating the society, the community, the government structures that maximize the ability of children of God to um, have the opportunities to save themselves. I think that's very well said. <clears throat> it reminds me of something that my wife frequently turns to, which is there, there's a real power and uh, a, a very powerful insight in the baptismal covenants that we read about in Mosiah. And what's, what's unusual about them is, you know, I'm reading a very prominent, popular uh, Anglican theologian at, at present, and he keeps returning to this theme that our principal task as human beings is to turn to God, to worship God, to reflect his glory. I find something almost perverse about that because it, it, if you think about the baptismal covenants in Messiah, they're not even covenants that we make with God. They're covenants that we make with each other, right? To lift burdens, mm -hmm. to comfort, to share pain and grieving. And it sounds to me like this is this is part and principle of what you're saying, is that, um, is that Latter-day Saints have a, a powerfully communalistic idea of salvation. And so it seems that the political sphere should be a kind of practice field or proving ground where we where we learn to work out some of these principles of community building and Zion building. Um, do you do you think that it would be a good thing for the church and for the uh, the public if there were a greater variation in in Latter Day Saint political affiliation? Do you think that the fact that the church trends so dramatically toward one party, do you think that that impedes our ability to be kind of bridge builders and peacemakers in the political sphere? I think it absolutely does. I think both on a, a real practical level, that um, when you can be taken for granted 
by both parties. Now, it's not just, you know, the Democrats know that they're, a, a presidential candidate knows they're never going to win in Utah. So a Democratic candidate may ignore them, and mm -hmm. a Republican candidate may take them for granted. So it just it diminishes our stature in national politics, for sure, that we um, are taken for granted by both sides, written off or assumed uh, from both sides. But I think it's also, you know, the church is increasingly diverse. Uh, we, are, we are no longer a, a U.S.-only church. We are um, ethnically, you know, diverse. Uh, even to a greater degree, philosophically diverse. Um, we have our core doctrines, of course, but but things that aren't core doctrine, that people have different opinions about things. And I think the more closely the church is tied to a political ideology, um, I think that's harmful for the church, especially when you look in the global sphere that, right. um, you know, one country may have an opinion about a U.S. action, uh, a trade action, a, a war, that, um, and to the extent that the church is seen as, as part of, an adjunct to a president or a um, political party, I think we suffer with that. I think it's important for us to be seen as supporting good men and women of, um, of both parties and, and looking for ideas. You know, neither party aligns with the church fully. Oh, can you just say that again? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think either political party aligns with the ideologies of the church. Yeah, I love, and shouldn't. I love those moments in the, I think it was the last general conference where I think, I think there were three separate brethren who all referred to the culture of Christ. And I thought, what a beautiful concept and what a beautiful idea if we could all really take that to heart, that that has to be our, our primary mode of identification and mm -hmm. affiliation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think we'd be better served and we would see, I think it'd be important for members to see that um, political politics is not church. Yeah. Final question. So what might we expect from you going forward? <laughs> <laughs> well, what plans and aspirations do you have? I, uh, I know this, that uh, I love public service. I do. Uh, and I think I've got more to give. I, I'm proud of proud of what I've, been, what I've been able to do in my public service and how I've been able to give back to, um, to a state, to a community, and to a church that I love. And I think I've, I've, I'm proud of my service. And I don't think my service is done. I don't know whether that means running for office in two years or 10 years. I don't know. I haven't made any decisions on that in that regard. There are people encouraging me to run again in two years. Um, there are uh, I see whether it's running for office or not. I see my I see civic engagement as part of my future, and and looking to continue to give what I have the blessings that I've received um, to give back to a state and a community and a church that I love. And I think that's my future. Well, thank you. Well, speaking as just one spectator, it's my impression that uh, you well represented your discipleship in the public sphere and I, I thank you for that and I thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you, you Ben McAdams. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for listening and a special thanks again to Ben McAdams for coming on to speak with Terrell. And as always to everybody who's left a positive review of our podcast or content on any platform, we really do appreciate it. We read each review and comment and are so grateful for the encouragement and for all the ways that you help get the word out about Faith Matters. And of course, as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.